What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Star Wars Explained. Today we have a very special guest, someone I've been excited to talk to for a while, since Rebel Rising, actually. But today, on the day that we're recording it, at least, is August 16th. We are celebrating the release of her brand new book, The Princess and the Scoundrel. So please welcome Beth Revis to the show. Hi, Beth. How are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us, especially today of all days. How does it feel? <laughs> To have it out in the wild now, it's it's um it's honestly I'm I, I'm I'm always caught up between the emotions of like happiness and excitement, and then also like incredible nerves and hoping that people like it. And there's there's no going back now, so I just have to roll with it. <laughs> well, we're we're gonna talk about the book very shortly, but I have a little icebreaker question that I like to ask all my guests um, because I'm I'm very interested in the characters that they like, but not really the main characters. And you you focused a lot on two of the big three of the original trilogy, but uh, I'd love to know if there's a character that is your favorite lesser known character, someone that you think you might be like their biggest fan in the world. So, so no Han, Leia, Luke, or Anakin, Padme, uh, Ray, Finn, none of the mains. It's just someone who might be more in the background. Any Star Wars fan will know of her, but I think if, unless you really read the comics and the novels, you don't know Dr. Afra. but I adore Dr. Afra with like every ounce of my being. She is so cool. She, I mean, she's basically Star Wars Indiana Jones and chaotic evil. And <laughs> I just, I love her so much. So for me, it's, it's Dr. Afra. She's the one character that I, I partly want to write her, but I also don't because then it takes the mysteriousness out of it. So I just I just love watching everything that she does. <laughs> I love Afra as well. So yeah. great choice. I, I adore Indiana Jones. I was kind of coming to the realization recently in the latest arc that she's more like a space Belloc or an Indiana Jones villain almost in some ways, because she's always the one that uh, winds up with the consequences of trying to use whatever artifact it is. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, I mean, she, de she definitely has a different set of morals from Indy, <laughs> but it's so much fun. <laughs> I, I agree. I love her so much. Um, so now we're going to kind of get into Princess and the Scoundrel, but I actually want to start with the acknowledgments of your book because mm -hmm. I found them to be incredibly charming, and it sounds like we had a very similar uh, introduction into Star Wars. And you talk about watching it for the first time uh, off of a VHS where your parents taped it off of TV or cable. Um, I had that exact same experience and I can vividly remember the commercials in the, the tape as well. Do you have any of those memories of what commercials you saw when you first were watching Star Wars? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I actually only remember it for The Return of the Jedi, which was not coincidentally my favorite of the three. Um, but right at the battle of endor when they're on the speeders and they're going through the forest the commercial break would cut to the dominoes noid and <laughs> i cannot watch that final battle without thinking of dominoes and the noid and avoiding the noid and that's just, kind of fitting yeah in my brain. <laughs> just like a weird creature to to be thrown into return of the jedi it already I mean, kind of fits does kind of fit with star wars <laughs> world but <laughs> uh you also said that your first star wars book was Rise of the Shadow Academy. What are your most fond memories of reading your first Star Wars book? I actually ended up digging out my exact copy that I had because <laughs> um, I got the the compiled ones that have like all the books in them. And back in the you know early 90s, they had those things where like Co Columbia Records where you could buy the records or I did the book version of it. And so I would scour them and get all of the books that I could and swap them with my best friend on the back of the bus. We lived very, very far out in the country. I didn't get home from the bus until almost six o'clock. We were on the bus for like an hour and a half. It was ridiculous. And we would just sit there and read these novels and swap them. She would get the ones that I didn't have. And we would like scour through them and then swap them and swap them back and forth. It was, it was great. It made the bus ride fun actually. <laughs> Uh, that that's kind of what I wanted to talk about because I had that exact experience as well. I had a friend who lived down the street and we basically had a Star Wars book club. We read Shadows of the Empire and Heir to the Empire. And like every day we'd be like, OK, tomorrow morning we're talking about chapters uh, six through eight. So make sure you read those. And then on the bus we would discuss. So <laughs> I, I really love those Legends books. They really shaped uh, my fandom as it is today. 
are there any ways that you think that those old books have shaped your fandom or even how you write Star Wars today? Yeah, I, I was very much a rule follower growing up. And I think reading the books made me realize that there were stories beyond the movies. And I don't know if I ever would have made that connection. I never wrote fan fiction as a kid, but I would read the stories, the legends and, and the, the background stories. And it made the entire universe feel so much bigger than it actually was in the films and it made it seem much more real and I don't I don't know if I could have approached fandom in the same way without having read those stories because to me it the movie was the story and that was it until I read the books and then realized that it was as if everything was real um not to quote Han Solo in the sequel trilogy or anything but it was real it was all that was real and it really made it come alive in a way that like burst my imagination and exploded my ideas and thoughts. Yeah, I, I kind of missed that era. I was thinking about it the other day where, you know, today fandom is so huge across not just Star Wars, but every fandom has TV shows and movies constantly coming out to look forward to. But back then it was like you had a couple movies and then you had books and comics. Yeah. And I... I, I remember reading just books for every little thing I was into, like even Resident Evil or Indiana Jones again. And you don't really have that as much now because you you can sit down and watch the shows. But uh, I, I always, always love trying to get people to read the Star Wars books because to me, they were always so core to yeah. uh, what Star Wars was. And it sounds like the same was true for you. Mm -hmm. as, as a Legends fan yourself, what was it like to tell a new version of a story that book fans got back in the 90s? Uh, because Princess and the Scoundrel, obviously the wedding of Han Solo and Princess Leia. It was um, highly intimidating. I mean, I definitely, to, to me, Star Wars is so personal to me, but I also have to remember that it's something that exists for almost everyone I know at this point. Like everyone knows Star Wars. It is it is a core memory of so many of our childhoods. It's, it's a beloved fandom. And as much as it's mine, it also belongs to everyone else. And knowing that I was basically standing on the shoulders of giants, um, really, it was very intimidating. And it was something that I didn't want to mess up, not just for myself. And because I love the story and the characters, I don't want to mess this up for all the fans and all the people who have come before me and the people who are willing to take a chance and explore a new part of the story. Um, so yeah, it was it was hugely intimidating. And it was something that I kept going back to a lot is, is the idea of making sure it's not fan service, but it's making sure that the people are happy with the story that I tell. Well, oh, I, I like what you just said about it not being fan service necessarily, but you still did so much that surprised me uh, in, a, in a great way when you were exploring Han and Leia as characters, uh, things I, I would not expect from the book, especially where Han had just lost a year of his life. And that was never something that really clicked with me where he wakes up and everyone's different now. But for him, it's been like maybe a day or two. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Maybe maybe no time has passed at all. Um, what was it like exploring that side of Han's character? And also, uh, we'll talk about Leia separately. <laughs> yeah, it, it surprised me, actually, because I fully intended to draw a lot from The Return of the Jedi. That was always the plan. It was always that they were going to get married on Endor. And so I thought I was going to do the most research on return of the jedi and actually i found for han i did the most research with empire and i kept rewatching empire and realizing like that that really was where his love was founded and then he had to go on pause and then deal with the aftermath and the fallout of losing that year of his life and so i had to keep going back to empire and looking at how he was then and realizing that he didn't have any time between that but leia moved forward through it and it's actually for me it became the thing that made their love story work because i think if if it had been reversed and leia had been frozen and Han hadn't, Han might have psyched himself out and talked himself out of everything and, and, and like pulled himself back. And Leia, meanwhile, wouldn't have had that time to think through everything and analyze every detail and learn what she really wanted. And so the reason to me why their love worked is because he's Han is frozen in empire and they have that year to 
have their separate timelines meet back up and really embrace that love. Yeah, I, I, I thought that that was perfect and it made so much sense. I, I hadn't thought about how insanely fast it was for Han, but um, Leia is like, yes, this makes sense to me. Uh, I've been trying to save you for a year. So yeah, let's make this official. Yeah, uh, so I, I thought that was great. Uh, what what does research look like uh, for a Star Wars book? Uh, it's that the best really research in the world, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> I just watched the movies on repeat, like, for several weeks straight. And I was taking notes. And, like, I would one time I would watch the movies and just focus on Han. And one time I would watch them and focus on Leia. But, like, watching those movies over and over, man, what hard research. I took <laughs> one for the team on that one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I understand that feeling. <laughs> and then, I, of course, I would go through the comics. I tend to read the comics when they're bound together. Um, but some of the storylines I wanted to pull from the comics hadn't yet gotten to the collected editions. So I had to go to my local comic store and find some of the individual episodes that I was looking for. So reading comics and watching movies and reading other books that take place in Star Wars. And that is the best research ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh Let's shift over to Leia a little bit. What was it like exploring her own feelings? And I love that you took the time to let her sit down and be like, this is all so messed up with learning that Luke is my brother and Darth Vader is my father and I have abilities in the Force. And what does all of that mean? Again, that was stuff that when you hear that the book is about the, the wedding of Leia and Han, I just, my mind did not go to that stuff, but I had so much fun exploring it. I really relied a lot on Claudia Gray and the stuff that she had done before her Princess of Alderaan book and Bloodline. And I kind of thought of the Leia and the Princess and the Scoundrel as the bridge between those two books, where in her version of the Princess of Alderaan, we see her roots and her foundation. And then in Bloodline, we see what has grown into a paranoia and a fear of what will happen when the truth comes out. And so drawing on those two books and meeting in the middle with the princess and the scoundrel was a real strong foundation for Leia's emotions and where she comes from on that. Um, but I also really, I have always, the one, the one fan point that I've always wanted to write was uh, the Leia's version of Luke's funeral. And getting to do that in chapter six of the book and kind of exploring what she would think of Vader's funeral and the, the pyre that Luke built for him. That was like my favorite thing to write. Like I love the kissing part too, but <laughs> angry Leia at the funeral pyre was really fun. Oh yeah. I, I, I like that Leia, I think this was kind of the case in Legends as well, that she never got to that same place that Luke did. Uh, that she, I mean, and I, I don't blame her. She was tortured by him. So uh, it, it's so interesting to see uh, that explored further. They, it's happened a couple times recently. Uh, Will Lark in the Alphabet Squadron books, we learned that there was a pilot that saw Luke and was just like, what is going on? Luke Skywalker is over there giving Darth Vader a funeral. This is weird and I don't get yeah. it. <laughs> so it's really cool to see it from uh, her point of view. But before Han and Leia get met, married, there is an incredibly fun Ewok bachelor party. Uh, mm -hmm. I get the sense that they throw absolute ragers uh, before any of them get married. What do you think their most unhinged activity would be if they were just left unchecked and uh, 3PO or Han and Luke were not there to keep them toned down? I, I do worry about the fact that they have so many fires and they basically live in wooden huts in a forest. And I think if, if Luke and Chewie in particular hadn't been there, everything would have just burned to the ground. And I think they would have laughed and cackled and danced around the flames because those, those Ewoks, man, they know how to party and they will burn it down to make sure it happens. Uh, there was such a good line uh, about, just what, what an Ewok is in that Chewie, a Wookiee, can pull your arms out of their sockets, but he won't. He has mm -hmm. some restraint. An Ewok can't, but absolutely would. And I, yep. I thought that was uh, brilliantly written <laughs> and very <laughs> funny. The, the whole first third of the book was just so much fun. Uh, you really got that sense of celebration, which the book is very much about all of it. Uh, but the, the Ewok celebration was so so much fun 
it was the uh, best part to write too. It was just, <laughs> I just kept thinking of like, what, how can I make this go even more sideways and how can I make things go even more downhill? <laughs> <laughs> was there a version that went too chaotic and any, did anyone have to tell you to tone it back a little bit? No, no, they kept, they actually gave me some ideas on making it even worse. Yeah. So <laughs> that was great. Cool. Uh, well, as crazy and chaotic and hilarious as that was, just pages later, the wedding itself uh, was very emotional, which I felt like I was getting whiplash in the best way. So how does one go about planning a wedding for Leia Organa and Han Solo? I think what what I kept coming back to is that they were just on the tail end of a very big battle, but also it's not been that long since Leia's lost her home. And it's such a big moment when Alderaan explodes, but it's such a personal moment for her. And if you're going to have a celebration of any kind, especially a life-changing celebration, you do always go back to the people that you don't have anymore. And just like in my own wedding, we had memorial candles for some of my relatives who could not be with us. Like that's the kind of thing that I wanted to make sure I touched on. And it's something that I think Leia would have dwelt on in particular. And so I really wanted to bring that in and also sort of bring in the idea that she she does have a family, even if she's not going to claim Vader as her family, she had a family and it was a real family and it was a perfectly valid family and not any lesser because she's adopted. Bale and Bria are her real parents. And I really wanted to hammer that home with the celebration of the wedding. I'm getting chills thinking about it again, but the, the moment where she feels the hilt of the sword back on her hip and she feels her parents there uh, was awesome. And like you said, it, it connects to bloodline and princess of Alderaan and even Obi-Wan Kenobi and her, uh, in the series, accepting that she doesn't need to know about her real parents, that she has everything she needs right there. Uh, that was so well done. Thank you. <laughs> and the, the the rings, all the, the again, chaoticness introduced by the Ewoks trying to get 3PO to officiate the wedding. Uh, just, you, you got all the emotions of happy, joy, funny, sad, uh, all in that one or two chapters about uh, Han and Leia. So the wedding was so great. Uh, <laughs> and to, to talk about Leia and the force a little more and her connection with like Bale and Brea, uh, I, I loved exploring her relationship with the force and what it means for the future. I'm curious what you think about her own future. Do you think she made the right choice in stopping her Jedi training? I, I think she did. In that she made the choice that was right for her in the time that it happened. And that that is a story I would love to see explored even more. I'd love to see a novel. Um, I'd love to write a novel <laughs> of Leia um, grappling with that decision. And I mean, in my mind, I think she didn't really come to the firm belief of what to do with the fourth until she was pregnant. Or at least um, until she had kylo as or ben as a young child and really thought about her connection with family and the force and so to me family and the force is irrevocably like bonded together with leia and if she feels that her family is threatened in some way um i think that would be the thing that would drive her from the force and from being a true jedi and that's a story that has yet to be explored that i really hope it does one day me too and yeah. i i think that you did touch on that already uh, I wrote some notes down where she had some very Anakin like thoughts. And, and I think that you're right, that she is so connected to her family and the idea that losing them, she, she said something about like, if I had that power, I would keep everyone close to me alive. And I was like, Oh, that's a slippery slope, Leia. So yep. <laughs> it, it does sound, I, I, it made me go, okay, this is the right decision for her. And I, I like the idea that she would continue to explore it and realize that uh, her attachments could lead her down a, a dark path. Even if she still has a connection to the Force, uh, she she might not be a full-on Jedi. And that it wasn't a decision based fully around just Ben and a vision that she saw, but it's also uh, her personality as well. Right. Uh, to get off of the off of indoor and into the honeymoon. Uh, I'll, I'll say that I was someone who was a little bit cynical when I heard the story was going to involve the Halcyon, but you very quickly 
gave it some weight I wasn't expecting, like you did with the rest of this story, uh, with especially the other passengers, kind of these rich and powerful people who would celebrate no matter who won the war. I really loved uh, that side of the story. So what was your biggest challenge, including the, the Galactic Star Cruiser in this story? I, for me, with the Halcyon, it was making it feel real. And that's where those people came from. Um, because the timeline is very crunched. It's a very tight timeline. Uh, I was building off the timeline that was established with Shattered Empire, in which there's, I think, exactly 21 days in between Han saying it's not over yet and the two of them being separated. So I had a very, very tight timeline timeline to to get them where they needed to be. And that made me think of who would be on the Halcyon. And the only people who would have that kind of celebration would be the people who could afford it and the people who would have celebrated anyway. And that really ended up setting the whole tone for Leia's experience on the Halcyon and how she viewed it and how she viewed the other guests and how she still had to interact with them in that way. Um, so that sort of like socio-political tension that that evolved happened from that timeline and looking at that tight timeline and then I of course had to figure out a way to make Han still have a storyline but not necessarily within that because I just don't think he would care that much he he just would not care about any of the people on there other than Leia and so I, I of course had to throw in a, a illegal card game going on in the engine room and that that was just sort of my way of having a little bit of levity and getting back to what Han would actually care about yeah, that, I think that there's always this thought uh, when something connects to, uh, especially like the Disney parks, that it, it's going to be very shallow. And there's this danger that uh, it's just going to be them going from room to room and experiencing what people could experience. And I, I had the same kind of like, oh, I don't know when Delilah Dawson wrote Black Spire. And both that and uh, Princess and the Scoundrel wound up being so much deeper then I think fans will initially guess uh, based off just the pitch alone. But I just applaud your ability to do that and go deeper and uh, put some weight behind why are we here and why it's important. Yeah, it's not a commercial. It's just a setting. Exactly. And, and really, it was the setting for like a third of the book. So <laughs> uh, what, what was it like developing the, the planet? that they go to they I'm going to like try to not go too deep into spoilers here because now we're in the like latter half of the book but what was it like to develop a, a new ice world uh, for Star Wars yeah, I, and I, how did I you make it feel distinct entirely distinct? off of Hoth actually yeah. because they they to me Hoth is one of the points where they start to shift their relationship and and it's it's still flirty it's not quite love yet but it's getting there and so I wanted to to sort of counter Hoth with a more beautiful world because um, Hoth is very um, it's very cruel it's, it's unforgiving you can easily die there but this matters is a, is a much different planet where it's, it's beautiful they take the ice and they make it beautiful so I wanted to do that but then I also wanted to play with the coldness and the idea of the carbonite freezing being something that would be still a physical memory for Han as well. So not getting too much into spoilers, but the reason why it became ice was to sort of counter Hoth and bring up carbonite freezing again. That's something that's come up in the comics as well quite a bit, just that Han hates the cold and always has even before the carbonite. Uh, so it was fun to explore that here. And speaking of the comics, and you already brought them up, Shattered Empire. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you kind of talked about cramming everything into the the short timeline um what is the process like when you are mapping out a story and you are given here's like right where it picks up immediately after return of the jedi and then you know how many days you have to work with uh how do you go about filling that space or or deciding how many days you want to fill up uh because that, that's always been a thing in Star Wars where it's like, we're going to set this book in between these other two books. And now we have to figure out how uh, the, the piece fits. What's it's it like to figure challenge. that out? Um, I, I try to consciously 
put things back in the box where, where I got them. So like, for example, in chapter six, when Leia picks something up, I have her put it back down so that if somebody else needs to come by and pick that thing up again, they could. Um, so I tried to, to leave a few little clues like that in there. And that, what I just said, will only make sense if you've read chapter <laughs> six. So sorry about that. Um, but then also with the timeline, I, tried not to be too specific like I was very aware that I had 21 days so like they have to get to the house on fast they have to get married fast they have to get there fast but I don't talk too much about those exact days so that if somebody needed to squeeze in an extra day they could or um or speed it up they could uh there's a little bit of hand waving going on with the time frame on that <laughs> there always has been so yeah <laughs> there's there's no issues there what was it like incorporating that I think first issue of Shattered Empire, was that something that you were like, oh no, I have to make sure that they go on this mission, this other mission to Endor? Because uh, I, I really was not expecting it almost. Uh, I, I'm so glad that it got included, but was that difficult or exciting? Or how is it to incorporate like a story that literally weaves throughout your own? It was a little difficult, um, I, but I actually really enjoyed it. And it became sort of a touchstone for the book itself because when Han, in Shattered Empire, Han says it's not over yet. And that became a line that I lifted and put in my own book, but also kind of a theme because a lot of people talk about how like they know how Han and Leia end up. They know what ultimately happens in their relationship, but it's not over yet. And so that became the running theme throughout the whole thing. Like Han and Leia don't know what's going to happen in the future and their love story is not over yet. And that, that really became just an emotional touch point for it. So I was really grateful to have Shattered Empire. I, I really loved that theme as well. The idea that I thought it was represented through their Ewok rings as well, that, you know, they are temporary but just because it's temporary doesn't mean it's not beautiful. And uh, even though it's temporary, like you're right, it never ends. Uh, <laughs> we, we were literally at a wedding this past weekend and uh, someone uh, in their speech to the, the new couple said they, they referenced Han and Leia and some of the nerds at the table were like, well, hold on now, because in The Force Awakens and I was like, they never stop loving each other. And I was thinking of this book. <laughs> When, I when absolutely they said agree. That. And, and we don't actually know what, what happened there at the end. Like they were separated, but not like separated. They weren't, they still loved each other. She's still wearing a ring. Uh huh. <laughs> Which that, okay, I'm trying not to go too deep into it, but I, I loved the ring. <laughs> that, <laughs> that little Easter egg at the end, I was like, that's perfect. So that was great. Uh, if you could give Han and Leia one piece of marriage advice, what would it be? Um, I would have I would have to give them separate marriage advice um, because they're they are two vastly different people. I would um, have to tell Leia to maybe find some patience and uh, <laughs> and not to jump to conclusions and to 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 consider Han. And I think I would have to tell Han to just um, to listen to his wife. <laughs> Because if Han would just listen sometimes, I think things would go a lot smoother. <laughs> but watching both of them learning to be a married couple and become part of a team uh, was a blast. So much fun to read. And I feel like I got some, I, I'm very much like Leia in this book, a bit of a workaholic, even on vacation, always thinking of the next stuff, uh, just like Leia, although my stakes aren't as high. But I still, I still felt like I got something out of it, some marriage advice for myself. <laughs> Yeah, there was a little bit of that for me, too, because I'm very much the same way. I have literally taken book work with me on um, vacations and things like that. Like everybody else will be lounging on the beach and I'll have my laptop and be huddled over it. And <laughs> my husband will be like, you can you can stop working for once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I before we go even further into spoilers, I, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about Rebel Rising, because that's another great book that you've written. Uh, ties into Rogue One and I think is going to have some strong connections to Andor as well in the future. So now that we have confirmation that Saw Gerrera, uh, which I would consider a character that you have really helped shape in the Star Wars universe, he's going to be an Andor. So is there anything that you're hoping to see from Saw specifically in the series? Um, 
first when I saw the trailer and I did not know until I saw the trailer that Saul was going to be in there. And when I saw Saul, I screamed so loud. I almost shattered the windows because I, <laughs> I, I hoped, but I didn't know. Um, I, if, if Saul even mentions Jen, that would be amazing to me. Or maybe if he could mention one of his missions, like the mission to Inusagi, which was a really um, strong turning point for Jen. Um, but yeah, if, if he could just mention it or, or mention how he doesn't want people to go into his home base or even if he just mentions his daughter, because he did see her as a daughter, like I'm getting goosebumps just thinking. about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely didn't seem like they were happy about uh, Luthan rail being in their base. They're all raising blasters at him. So yeah. <laughs> there was a little bit of that. Uh, I am really hopeful. I've, I've brought up uh, the mission with, their, their attack on that party with the flechettes and everything. I've brought up that part of that book so many times where I, I that to me is Saw Gerrera, where it's kind of the point where you see, because I feel like it's always hinted at in Rebels or even Rogue One. Rogue One shows it on Jedha, but that he goes too far for the rebellion. And there's a reason he has been set apart from it. So that's kind of, I want to see that on screen i want people to feel uncomfortable being like oh yeah saw Gerrera is a good guy just because he fights against the empire no. so how, how did you write that scene how did you come up with that because that is like one of the most brutal things that i have read in a star wars story oh thank you um that was <laughs> that was one of the few scenes i think that never changed like from original idea to final version I don't think any part of that changed. And to me that, because reading the Rogue One script and learning who Jin was as an adult, I had to go backwards in time and figure out who she was as a child. And then as a teenager and saw was the biggest influence on her life. And I really needed something that would make her break from him because he becomes her father figure. She rejects her father because she thinks, bad things about him she rejects him and looks at saw as her father he calls her daughter she thinks of him as father but she needed something that was dire enough for her to break from from him and that was always it was always the plan to have that happen at inasagi and um yeah i don't i don't want to spoil <laughs> it if you haven't read it but but yeah that that was one of the few scenes that it was from the start that was how that scene was gonna go that's, I am prepping a, a collection of stories to watch or read before Andor comes out. And Rebel Rising is a part of that list specifically because of uh, Andor, or, uh, because of Saw and, of course, uh, Jin. I'm not expecting Jin to be in Andor. Are, are, are you thinking that? or No, I mean, if, if no, I, I don't think, I don't think she will be. But I, I, I kind of feel the her. same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea of yeah, saw just that being another step towards him being unhinged. <laughs> oh, and, oh, uh, oh! It would be so cool if he if he imagined a threat against her, and then I can't wait for it. I just can't wait for it to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that series is yeah. going to be great. I'm glad you're excited about it too. Um, uh, the last question I have uh, for. Uh, Rebel Rising and Andor is uh, what do you think is Saw Gerrera's greatest flaw? It's he doesn't see a line. Um, it's not just that he's willing to cross the line. It's that he doesn't see a line. And so whenever he's thinking about what needs to be done, he takes in no considerations on anyone else because he, he just doesn't even see that there is a line that exists. And to me, that happened from the clone wars when his sister dies and i think she was his line and she was the thing that held him back and he just completely broke from that concept of any type of restriction on good or evil when she died and so to me her death was the turning point of him and then that became the turning point of Jin, and that became the turning point of the rebellion and i just see her death being the thing that spins everything out and as much as I don't want her to have died in the first place because she was an awesome character, um, it kind of shows how important each individual person is. And the fact that Saul becomes the type of man he does is because he doesn't see 
any limitations or any reason to have any type of restraint. And that is a dangerous person. That's another hope I have for Saw and Andor is some reference to Stila. Yeah. The uh, comic adaptation of Rogue One by Jody Hauser, his final words is Stila uh, on Jeddah. And I was like, oh, they, uh, they couldn't have done that in Rogue One because just it would have confused everybody. But I hope <laughs> that they take some time to, again, mention her and Jen and his past uh, in Andor. But that those are all of the questions that I have. So where can people follow you online? And what other non-Star Wars books have you written that you would recommend to your Star Wars readers? Um, I am online all over the place. I am at BethRevis.com. And on social media, I'm mostly at Beth Revis, um, on any platform, basically. Uh, if you like Star Wars um, in the way that it has kissing in space, then I recommend my book, Across the Universe. It is a murder mystery aboard a generational spaceship. Um, and if you like uh, any other like twistiness type of stories. I have The Body Electric or A World Without You. And I've also delved into fantasy with a book called Give the Dark My Love and um, its sequels. So I am all over fantasy and sci-fi and just love telling the stories. <laughs> just, but you mentioned the kissing in space and it jogged a memory in my head that when they released uh, the excerpt of, I believe the prologue of the book, uh, it, the the very last line about Leia knowing what's going to happen tonight. I saw people reacting to that as if it were the sitcom uh, <laughs> laugh track, like the ooh, everyone freaking out <laughs> over that line. <laughs> and I was like, yep, that sounds perfect. That's exactly yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the book is The Princess and the Scoundrel. It is out right now. Uh, go check it out. I thought it was an absolute joy to read. Just a, a happy book through and through. Uh, if you like Han and Leia, you're going to love this as well. But I'll uh, have links to all of Beth's socials and website down in the description. And thank you all so much for joining us and watching us or listening to us if you're on the podcast. And may the Force be with you. <laughs>